And at this time, I would like to introduce Andrew Seeger, who is the uh, facilitator of the Urban School Improvement Alliance. And he'll be moderating today's session. Uh, and I uh, want to welcome you, Andrew. Thank you so much, Peter. And uh, welcome to everybody who's signed on. Uh, welcome to the Long Now, Local Data in an Era of State Longitudinal Data Systems. We uh, hope that you find this a really useful presentation. I just want to, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm looking uh, at the polls right now. And it's that, uh, I just lost them, that there are a, uh, a number of, a, a range of people. And uh, we anticipate that more may be joining as, as this uh, continues. Uh, the presentation itself has uh, four major segments. The first is a presentation by uh, Neil Gibson, uh, The Long Now, and he'll explain why that title. Uh, that'll be followed by a question and answer session with Neil alone, uh, facilitated by Anthony Petrosino, another member of the USAI support team. Then uh, Paul Schlickman, who, as Peter mentioned, is the district coordinator for research testing and assessment in the lower Massachusetts public schools and a member of the Urban School Improvement Alliance, uh, will present. And then finally, uh, Dave Phillips, the third member of our support team, will facilitate a discussion of, uh, uh, which involves both uh, Paul and, and Neil. So. Uh, and as Peter mentioned, we really ask you to stay on and, and take the stakeholder feedback survey. We use those data uh, for <coughs> assessing our performance and uh, really appreciate your uh, few minutes that it takes to complete them. I wanted to uh, ask you now to take a poll um, and uh, to identify which of these uh, applies to you. And uh, if you can just fill this in, uh, most appreciated, and we'll just see um, as you go now uh, what uh, what sort of, uh, I see we have a few other, but uh, about, well, nearly half, it's quite a range, 41% uh, of you making decisions about research projects in your organization. Uh, some making decisions about data security uh, and uh, using data from longitudinal data systems, nearly half of you, and uh, using district data, 40% uh, of you. So um, we'll, we'll move right on from that, uh, if we may. And um, I, w I want to just say a few other things uh, about the, before we get on to the main presentation. Peter mentioned uh, where our members are from. This gives you a sense from all the, all the states in the region that uh, have urban schools. And this map shows you not only the locations, but also the names of members. I, the urban school, just a little bit of background on the Urban School Improvement Alliance. Uh, these are the focus areas. One is to facilitate the pursuit of coherent research agendas within state and local education agencies. Another is to develop relationships and share information across state and other boundaries to improve data utilization for improving low-performing schools. USIA meets formally four times a year, and members also uh, interact informally in between those times and, and have uh, found it very useful to, to share with each other. And the third, to develop the capacities that enable districts to use longitudinal data to inform pressing questions of policy and practice. And of course, this. Uh, this webinar is, uh, is uh, in that vein. Uh, some of the works we've completed or are in progress. We have a toolkit for districts working with external researchers. This relates to that whole issue of helping districts, and it could be used by states too, to uh, proactively develop research agendas rather than wait for research to approach them. Uh, we are providing support for districts using data for decision making, particularly at the district and school board level within our membership. Uh, this is an area where there's little research, and we want to collect some more information about it. Uh, following the Alliance's requests, we have developed some school uh, survey modules. 
Uh, the modules, once again, can be used in, are actually modules, so they can be used to range from climate to data use to a number of other topics. And we've also developed some workshops on practitioner data use and building a culture of data use. Uh, the, um, the workshops were delivered to members, uh, but we anticipate that this summer with those workshop materials will be available, broadly available, they're done the review process right now. Uh, the session goals, uh, I, I want to let you know these because they, uh, they relate to the survey at the end. One is to increase understanding of the ways of expanding database capacity without significant equipment investment. Uh, and uh, some I interesting ideas about that. Convey a strategy for meeting FERPA security and privacy expectations and language that communicates these to a broader audience. Uh, and the, the headlines recently suggest why that might be necessary. An increased understanding of common misuses of databases and common unsubstantiated imputations of causality. So those are the uh, objectives. Now, as, as we move through the presentation, we invite you to submit your questions in the general chat on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, clarifying questions, there will be always people monitoring that who are not speaking, um, so we can collect those for the presenter so that the presenter can respond as he goes along. And the substantive questions will be posed to the presenter during the Q&A period. So uh, uh, please do use the chat, and uh, we will uh, We'll carefully monitor and make sure that your questions are addressed. Now to the feature presentation by uh, Neil Gibson. Uh, he's director, as, as uh, Peter mentioned, of the Arkansas Research Center. He's also executive director of the Arkansas Longitudinal Multi-Agency Data System. He has a small staff and little funding, and so has learned how to work efficiently. He works across agencies and is pioneering work in safe storage and transfer of data and also has a number of interesting thoughts about how to begin to use our uh, longitudinal data systems now rather than having to wait years for them to, uh, to uh, mature. In addition to his current position, he's been a teacher, a technology coordinator, and a network administrator in school districts. And uh, most recently, he was two miles from the tornado that swept through Arkansas with such devastation and that uh, certainly uh, shook his place. So with that, uh, and no further ado, Neil, uh, we welcome you and um, look forward to listening to you. All right. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat> yeah, I am Neil Gibson. Um, I wanted to start, the, the title references uh, this group out of San Francisco that's building uh, this clock that's up there. It's a 10,000-year clock, and I just like it because if, if you're anything like me, these days you spend most of your time seemingly reacting to things instead of in this idea of uh, thinking in terms of the, of the long now. And it is also important, I think, that when people build these longitudinal data systems, they have an idea that we're building this capacity that will service in the future. But I also want to make the point that once you build the capacity, you can have access to historical data to see what the long-term trends are. And I want to give an example of that. But also, I primarily want to discuss uh, with you folks and, and have a discussion afterwards about what are the real use cases for these data. So now um, we're, we're having a little bit of funding problems, and so I have to go make the case about what are the compelling uses of this that, that would warrant public, uh, public investment in these. Before I move on, I wanted to um, point out what I, as I said, I used to teach high school. My last year to teach was in 2006, and so I, I, I wanted to show you the classes I taught. The East class was actually one of my favorites. That was a project-based learning, and the reason I taught that one is it allowed me to teach middle school students, and they're, they're kind of my favorite. But most of my teaching was in high school, and in, in 2006, I taught uh, Cisco Networking Academy, Oracle Academy, and I taught uh, AP American History and AP Computer Science. And what's interesting about uh, these classes is, is, except for East, the project-based learning, they all have what I want to call, and, and people can feel free to push back on it, but it is some kind of post-secondary credential. It's certainly that way for the Cisco and Oracle classes, because for the Cisco class, the goal was a two-year program. The goal was at the end of the program, the students would take an industry test 
CES from Cisco and they've become certified uh, Cisco Network Associates. Oracle was a two-year program also. The first year you could take a test from Oracle to become uh, an associate DBA, and the second year was Java programming. And then the advanced placement, though, is kind of the same idea because, again, you take an assessment from a third party to demonstrate that you are at the level beyond uh, secondary education. The, the funny thing is, is, is I was putting this presentation together, when I put all those things together, at the time I was teaching it, I didn't realize I was a vocational ed teacher. And for goodness sakes, I never got any Perkins funding either but because I wasn't technically a vocational ed. Though it's clearly I was teaching vocational ed, though I did not make any distinction between teaching Cisco and teaching AP American History. The reason I taught those classes is where I was at, which is uh, where I still live. Uh, we actually have two, two places because I work in the center part of the state and I have a farm up north. And this was at the farm. The kids that I served needed access to curriculum that was rigorous and relevant to their future life. And I believe all those classes met that. And I want to make sure people understand, I didn't teach Cisco because I wanted all my kids to have jobs programming routers. I taught Cisco because that was a rigorous set of uh, skills that they could learn that would serve them later in life, not necessarily uh, programming routers, but learning how to learn. And if there's any skill that, that is necessary for the future, it's that. Uh, the average person now changes jobs every 4.4 years. So I think some of these distinctions we make between career and college readiness, and they're certainly not that way in Common Core, but we have to kind of rethink some of these links. So uh, we are the Arkansas Research Center. These are the uh, agencies that we serve, the Arkansas Department of Education, Department of Higher Education, Workforce Services, Career Education. We do a lot of work with the Arkansas Association of Two-Year Colleges, and what we have discovered is that it's actually the two-year college folks that are most interested in these data because they have a sincere interest in seeing how their programs are getting their clients jobs and, and, and bettering their lives. We also work with Arkansas Department of Human Services, which provides the state pre-K program. And we also uh, work with the Head Start program in the state. And then our final partner is University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, which is the uh, uh, doctor prep, me, the only medical school in the state right now. And they've become excellent partners too. And I want to give an example of the work we've done with them. So this is part of a study, uh, again, this is in, in thinking in terms of the long now. We had a doctor from UAMS, Jeffrey Kaiser, he's a NICU doctor, that came to us with an idea that he had. And what he was frustrated with was the fact that in his world, uh, all they really cared about was dismissal. Could they get the baby, the patient, well enough where they could be dismissed from the hospital? And if that case was made, if that happened, then they, they claim success. But he wanted to know what are the long-term effects of these things that happened to these babies when they were in the NICU. And specifically, he was interested in this thing, is blood thickness, hematocrit. And we were able to uh, give him a protocol. The way our, um, our organization works, we're really a trusted broker. And we do all this in a protected way, in a de-identified way. And it turns out that our protocol that we suggested to him was also HIPAA compliant. And so he wrote up the proposal and put it through the IRB. And they have a very strict IRB uh, a panel at, at uh, UAMS. And he said this was the first time ever that one of his proposals went through the very first time. So. That's the other thing about these systems is that we don't necessarily recognize it first. They're all, they're all fairly new, and we still don't know what all the compelling use cases are. I'm very proud of this research. Uh, it is added. It's been published. It's been added to the knowledge that we know at a uh, whole. Can I say this kind of stuff is enough to go to someone and say this is why we should be funded? And I think the answer is no. But I do think this is an important part of what we uh, are, are what we are able to do and that I hope we are able to do more of this stuff in the future. 
The other thing we have to talk about, and that's what came clear during the planning of this, is that the climate for these things is changing dramatically. So here's a, here's a story from the Wall Street Journal. I, I don't know how familiar most of you folks are with this or not, but this is concerning a, a nonprofit called Emblem that was started with uh, a, a grant. And I don't know completely about Emblem because we were not one of the states. Originally, there were seven states that were participating in this, and, and our state was not one. I'm, I'm not sure why or why not. It's neither here nor there. I, as I understand it, what Emblem was trying to do was make it where schools and districts could upload student data to Emblem. And then Emblem could make that data available to uh, vendors. For example, let's say uh, you wanted to do a, a reading, pro an online reading program at your school. Normally, that would require somebody, the vendor, sending somebody down to hook up to your data system so they get the data and provide the service. Well, Emblem was going to take care of all that. But what happened to Emblem was a labeling problem that they got labeled as a national database that's collecting all this student data, and they're going to have data from all students all across the nation. And then it turned into a privacy nightmare, and states one after another started pulling out. And that's somewhat an isolated story, except for this story that came out uh, last weekend in the New York Times. And I was kind of aware of this one, because we had a little taste of this in our own state. The legislature put together two days of testimony around Common Core. And uh, one was for and one was against. And there was uh, a quite a bit of uh, consternation about this. But now I can see this is also at a national level. And if you, uh, you probably can't read the story, but one of the things I was unaware of is that uh, the people that are fighting Common Core are now calling it Obama Core. So again, now Common Core itself has this labeling issue. And I think the only thing you can do is try to get out in front of these things and try to make your case about what your actual intentions are. And then last week also this story came up, and then this is the, the old InBloom website. You can see support for teachers. I honestly believe what they were uh, trying to do was a needed service and a, a very important service. But again, they got uh, killed by this uh, labeling problem. And the funny thing about it is, is they had the potential to actually protect student privacy better than what's going on now. Because the real threat to your child's privacy is not something like Emblem. It's somebody at a school mailing or, or emailing a whole bunch of student data to someone so they can get a system up and running quickly, or keeping a lot of things in paper around. That's the real threat to privacy. And, and I want to make that case a, a little bit stronger. This, these are the principles that, that we abide by here at the Arkansas Research Center, privacy by design. Now, I will, I will tell you before you go out there and rush to it, uh, a little caveat. And the, the caveat is this comes from Canada. So some of these folks are suspicious of things coming from Canada, too. But it's a pretty simple idea. There are seven different principles uh, of privacy by design. And the, the basis is privacy must be embedded in the design. And we certainly have that here. In terms of K-12, the most important thing that you can wrap all these seven principles around is this one idea, is that we do not proliferate personally identified identifiable information. And again, I honestly believe in Bloom could have played a very important role in that, but they never got a chance because they got labeled as something else. They didn't step out in front and, and define what it is that they were trying to do. But this is something that we should all be committed to, is the non-proliferation of personally identifiable information. And to be perfectly honest, we sometimes uh, have to kind of fight with agencies to make sure that, that that doesn't happen. But we're definitely committed to that. And the reason I'm committed to that is I have a 16-year-old son that's in this system. And, and, and only those people that need to see his data at whatever level need to see it. It doesn't need to be just sitting out there because somebody was lazy and sent all this data via email. Oh, hey, I already mentioned I used to be a classroom teacher, and I love to assess early and assess often. So I thought we'd take this moment uh, to have uh, our own kind of interactivity. And this, uh, since we were talking about uh, Common Core, I, I thought 
just to judge what you folks know, Common Core was proposed by which of these agencies in order to bolster the country's competitiveness? Uh, Department of Ed, NSA, blow on and so forth. So now we're going to switch, and we're going to let you answer that question. And I'm not letting you see the responses because I didn't want anybody to get prompted. I'm just curious myself what folks think. And since this is um, primarily a K-12 group, I would assume that you folks know the answer. We don't have a lot of people aren't answering questions. I have to tell you, when I was a teacher, that wasn't an option. Everyone had to participate. I don't have any way to enforce it over the phone here, except please know that I'm looking at you with a extremely uh, foul look. That was always the thing I could do as a teacher. I could give them a very stern look. I was ex-military, so I had that going for me, too. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and broadcast the results. Uh, it's going slow, but here you go. And um, it looks like over half got the correct answer. So I'll uh, switch here, and it goes back. Though we did have uh, some people uh, do the incorrect response, it did not come from the U.S. Department of Education. So the labeling of Common Core as Obama Core is simply untrue. It actually came from, oh, my thing didn't stick, National Governors Association. And that's a key point. And I, I should also point out, not only did it come from the NGA, their partner in this was also the CCSSO, the uh, Council of Chief State School Officers, and specifically Gene Wilhoyt. If you wanted to label Common Core accurately, I really honestly believe it should be called Wilhoyt Core. And he's kind of getting, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of sad to call him something else. He doesn't get the credit that he's due. Plus, Gene is about the nicest guy on the planet, and I can't imagine anybody talking to this guy think he had anything nefarious at all in mind when he came up with Common Core. Common Core was created and was signed on to by 44 governors in this nation, both Democrats and Republicans, male and female, I think the primary reason was because of the rigor and relevance Common Core represents. And so now there is this movement, and it's kind of hard to judge how big it truly is to try to get rid of Common Core. So what is the motivation of that group? And I don't truly understand it all. So I got to go back to this case now that we are are have these states or have these SLDS systems in in most states we have these productions going on. What is the compelling use case that I could go to someone, for example, and this is a really bad time to do this in the state of Arkansas. I'm not sure it's a good time to do it in any state. We had never sought out state funding before. We always had the concept that what we would do is that we would build this capacity and then we would provide services to our partner agencies. And that has worked out pretty well, but now it's become clear that probably we also need some kind of legislation to, to make it more permanent. So I have to make this case. Why does the Arkansas Research Center exist? And what I've discovered over the years doing this, working with all these different agencies, is that we are something of a data concierge. So we get calls for people that want data, and they say, well, do you have this? And I say, no, but we know who does. You should go talk to them. So that's just one of the things we do. And even for K-12, which we do a number of services that aren't related to the SLDS directly, for example, we do accountability. We do work around Perkins. Uh, I do all kinds of work. And what we just, and a lot of work with special ed that even within a single agency, the people that are responsible for all these different programs don't talk to each other. For example, most of the special education folks aren't in the department. They're actually in a building that's about three miles away. And, and so if even within the department they're not talking, you know that the departments themselves are not talking between each, each other either. And what I've come to the to decide is that this whole education, training, 
workforce, what used to be called a pipeline, is in reality a stack. And I call it a stack because people can be in different layers of the stack at different times. And they can also be in, in, in multiple levels of the stack. And technology tells us how to make a stack more efficient. And it's twofold. Number one, you vertically integrate, but you keep them loosely coupled. And I think the base level of that, of vertical integration between agencies, is their ability to share data with each other. Now, I want to make sure you don't, you don't think that, that it only counts if they're sharing data at the individual level, and that's not true at all. There is all kinds of data that all these agencies have that they could be sharing in a meaningful way, and the most meaningful measure are those measures that quantify the handoff where a, person, a client is when they leave one agency and go to the other. And that's a, those are very important metrics that can help us understand the stack as a whole. But right now, the different layers of the stack don't communicate with each other at all. And I think an excellent example of that is they do not share data. So this is the case I want to build, is how we can help integrate this, this stack but yet keep it loosely coupled. The last thing on earth we need is, is one ring to rule them all. No, no. Modern technology, Web 2.0, is all about integrating systems but leaving them loosely coupled. So I do think we have some unique opportunities with these SLDS programs, and especially unique opportunities for local schools and districts to participate in that as well. The first thing we have to decide on is this idea of meaningful measures. Again, I'm a little nervous about the political climate, but I honestly believe that, that measures are really apolitical. Now, granted, what you choose to measure can be political, but measurement itself is really apolitical. And so my case is, is, is all I'm interested in is good management. And I don't see that as a left or right issue. Surely everyone can be on board with good management. And for good management, I think most business leaders would tell you, you have to have good measures. We, especially in uh, state government are far from measurement poor. That was the other eye-opener for me, is when I actually started looking that all that was available, especially in workforce, and that's uh, where I've been spending quite a bit of my time lately. There is so much data out there, it is mind-boggling. I swear to you, it's like the uh, warehouse on Raiders of the Lost Ark, that some of this data just goes in there to be lost for some reason. It's kind of crazy. So I'm definitely not calling for new measurement, just a repurposing of what we're doing right now. And this I, I believe in wholeheartedly, too, is that uh, if you have too many measures, if you have too much data, it can lead to a poverty of understanding. And there's a, a, I remember watching a speech by Scott McNeely, who used to run Sun Microsystems, and he was real proud that him and his wife put uh, both their children in public school until they got a state report card about the schools that their students were in. And they could not make sense of it because there was too much data involved. And I think anybody involved in the state report card can understand where he's coming from. And he said once they got that, the first thing he did, him and his wife went down and, and, uh, and removed them from public school and put them in private school. So we have to be cognizant of our users. What, what can we do to actually make people understand what is important? And for that, I'm calling it, this is my new mantra now, we need meaningful measures. So this is this, and I've got a plan for this I'm going to briefly touch on. This one is front and center now, not only because the in-bloom, it, uh, it also just because of the creation of these systems, it brings up you know, these privacy and confidentiality issues. And I first want to point out that it, they're really different things and that they get confused, and so that kind of complicates things. But I want to make sure that privacy is the general idea that, that people, especially government folk, shouldn't be asking. That's privacy, don't ask. Confidentiality is don't tell. So to make that case, I want to uh, show you a story. So this story comes from uh, 2006. And it says uh, basically what happened is a uh, contract worker working for the Bureau of Veterans Affairs had personally identifiable data on his laptop at his house. His house got broken into. The laptop was stolen, so he had to report it. And so now the VA 
had to report uh, to the 26 and a half million veterans whose records were lost that we had a data breach and that, that you should probably be uh, um, on the lookout for them. The reason this story is important is because one of those 26 and a half million veterans was me. So privacy has been on my front page for a very long time. And not only that, two years later after this, in 2008, it happened to me again. A tape was lost by the state that contained unencrypted name, date of birth, and social security number. Now, in this story, I like the last paragraph right in there. It says, the data contained names, social security numbers, and dates of birth of the veterans, but did not include any health or financial records. Oh, thank goodness. The thieves aren't going to know that I have gout, and they're not going to know how little money I make. I feel so relieved, except for the fact that they have my name, date of birth, and social security number, which is all they need to go and apply for a credit card in my name or even get a mortgage. So this one is uh, this one's kind of personal. But now it's another teaching moment uh, because uh, as a teacher, we're supposed to check for understanding. So I ask you folks, what kind of breach was this that happened in 2006? Was it privacy or confidentiality? Let's see if So that's confidentiality. Going back to the veteran story, this is what's so sad. That one could have easily been contained if the person doing that would have done either, well, everyone here is required to do both. So any sensitive data, any data that we have that has personally identifiable information on it must go on an external drive. And it must also be encrypted. And we here have standardized on this software, TrueCrypt. It's free. It's open source. It is industry grade. Uh, and so you simply encrypt one of these terabyte external drives. It takes about six hours to encrypt a drive, as I recall. But once it's encrypted, it, it operates at normal speed. Everything is fine. So this would have solved that simple problem with the, the contract worker from the Bureau of Veterans Affairs having his laptop stolen. You don't keep confidential information on your laptop. Keep it on an external drive that's encrypted. If you lose that for whatever reason, again, no one can break into it. Oh, hey, we've got another interaction. I love interactivity. This one's a little tougher. We'll see how you folks are going. Maybe you guys are up on the news. You've seen this guy's picture. His name's... on the other ones. 
Let me broadcast the results so you can see for yourself. And as you can see, most people believe it was the NSA. Now, just so you know, Edward Snowden did work for the NSA earlier, but at the time that he, if we can go back to the presentation mode, uh, at the time that he stole the documents and fled to Russia, he was not working for the NSA. He, uh, he was actually instead working for these folks, BAH, which stands for Booz Allen Hamilton. That's a civilian contractor that was helping uh, the Air Force and NSA uh, with these data. And I want to make sure that I'm not going to debate on you know, the NSA's the legalities of anything they were doing. The Air Force came out and said the BA Booz Allen Hamilton had done nothing wrong. We've already had kind of this discussion. The reason I wanted to bring this up is there is a way that the NSA could have provided these data to Booz Allen Hamilton so their sharp people like Edward Snowden could have done their analysis, but yet would have made it in a way that Edward Snowden wouldn't have had anything to take to Russia. And that's our protocol for how we do that. And it's called Trust Ed. And I know this looks complicated. We came up with this uh, framework uh, in 2009 when we applied for an SLDS grant. We were still under uh, the original FERPA. And this was the idea that we came up with to make these data compliant with that. And as I already mentioned, the same protocol means that it's also HIPAA compliant. If you look at the top is a record from John Smith. It's a wage record from the UI wage system. That record is plutonium, as I tell everybody in my office. So we have set up software. It's, it's twofold, Tim and Kim. What Tim does is our identifier manager. Tim will take that plutonium and split it in half and send to Kim, which is the one that does our matching of people, entities. It will send the personally identifiable stuff to Kim, which will match it and actually uh, we've done a lot of research about that uh, matching. That that was kind of our our area of focus for a long time. We've had three PhDs come out of the research in that, so we're kind of proud of our work. Uh, anyway, that's neither here nor there. Kim will spit back an ID saying this person is this. It's a Kim ID that has no meaning to SSN or name or any of that thing. Tim will take that ID and encrypt it using what's called format preserving encryption. So you can see that ID, the Kim ID, now becomes a WF49271. And Tim, at the same time, will join back to that the research data of interest. That is the fact that this WF1 makes $35,000 at ACME. And so this is what we do research on, is this record here that has no link to name, SSN, or date of birth. And this whole process is called homomorphic encryption. Can you say that? I knew you could. So what I'm suggesting here is that the NSA would take in all that data, they had metadata about phones and who's talking to who and whatnot, and it used this idea, this idea of homomorphic encryption before giving it to Booz Allen Hamilton. Edward Snowden finds something of interest. They report back the idea of interest to the uh, NSA. They can unencrypt it, see who that's about, or get a court order to unencrypt it and, 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 and do uh, what's necessary after that. So again, we have taken this extra step using homomorphic encryption because the nonproliferation of PII is front and center to everything we do at the Arkansas Research Center. So what are some of the bread and butter things that come out of this? So this is our third Arkansas Education to Employment report. Uh, and what this represents, as you can see, this, this chart here I think sums up things pretty well as in terms of capacity, is that in 2012, by best accounts of workers at that time that we could tell what their highest level of educational attainment was, is that if you had a high school or diploma or less in, in 2012 in the state of Arkansas, your average salary was $13,000. So that should be worth a pause to think about how your life for you and your family would be if you made $13,000 a year. And please remember, most of these folks have children also. So we're not just talking about them having a tough life. It's them and their children 
having a tough life. And what we're able to demonstrate in this report is the fact that every level of educational achievement, even the level of just some college, translates into some salary boost. And so you can see if you make a bachelor's degree, uh, you're over $36,000 a year, and that's quite a jump over a high school diploma. But we also need to be able to illuminate pathways for folks. So again, let's take the idea of a single mom that has a baby and, you know, trying to make that decision, my goodness, what is the best path forward for our family? To let them know little details that they might not be aware of, such as this, is that an, a technical certificate has about the same average wages as a, an associate's degree, even though you can get a technical certificate in less time. That's a key, a key thing that someone that's thinking about a change may want to know about, and those people that might be counseling them on the best path forward need to be aware of too. So we need to kind of propagate this, uh, these ideas out there. This is especially true in Arkansas, so I wanted to show you this. So these bar charts represent the percent of the uh, workforce by educational achievement. The first bar is from 1973. I was 12 years old in a farm in Arkansas listening to FM radio music from Memphis, Tennessee and from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, red is high school diploma. You can see the key on the right and blue is dropout. So you can see in 1972, 72 percent of the workforce in this nation had a high school uh, diploma or less, and only 28% had an associate's degree or more. What has happened in the, the three decades since is the fact that two forces, globalization and, um, and automation, have squeezed out opportunities for unskilled workers to the point that now 41% of the workforce, as of 2007, this is all census data, only 41% of the workforce has a high school degree or less, and now the AA or more has jumped up to 42%. For in terms of the Arkansas SLDS, what can we show the state, what can we help illuminate is this fact, is that in the state of Arkansas, those with a high school degree or less is 52% while those with an AA or more in the workforce are only 26%. So in some ways, Arkansas in 2012 is still stuck in the 70s. And that's the reason Arkansas remains one of the poorest states in the nation. And it gets even worse because if you consider the 2007 U.S. Uh, numbers, the 41% the with a high school diploma or less, you know, if, if, if you believe Tom Friedman's The Earth is Flat, America's getting left behind at 41%. And if America is getting left behind at 41%, what is happening to the state of Arkansas at 52%? And that's a, that's a tremendous chasm for this state to cross, to go from 52 even to the national level of 41. What are the pathways for Arkansas to achieve that? And so I'm trying to make this compelling case for the need. And here's another representation. Oh, I go back. Uh, Jenny, we're going to try the transition now. And this is also funny thing is that we uh, originally were going to do uh, this one way with just because of this mode, but the minute I saw this map, I recognized it immediately, and it's, it's the map that, that you can also see from 1860, and what that map represents is that's the, the dawn of the Civil War, 
and that is the slave popul or actually the percent of a slave population by county. And those areas that are darkest are at um, 80%. And these two maps are, for all intents and purposes, uh, the same. And if you don't believe me, I just simply just take a look between the two maps here at the St. Louis area, the area of northern Kentucky, and then the area of, I'm in interest of is uh, Tennessee, Arkansas, Mississippi, the Delta, where the Blues were born. To me, those two maps are identical. So that tells me, as a researcher, whatever we've been doing to fix this for 150 years is not working. So again, I'm trying to make this compelling case for need. The other thing that's important about it is, is you know, the, the Southeast Conference area, we, we know why it's that way, because of the map there. This in Michigan is the same thing, but for a different reason and also Indiana and Ohio. So any solution that we might craft for this in the Southeast Conference is likely not to be applicable to Michigan. And then also we have this in uh, South Dakota, New Mexico, Arizona, and Alaska, dark red again, for different reasons. And that is why I think, especially those states that have these red areas, it is important to have as fine a grain as detail about these pathways as possible before you're ever going to be able to solve these problems. So I think we'll go back to the presentation now. Oh man, Jenny is a genius. Thank you, Jenny. And so I have an answer. And my answer is, if you really want to solve this, what's the answer? And the answer is, wait for it. <laughs> Data. Oh, my goodness, it flashed off on me. It's data. Now, some people would say, well, wait a minute, Neil. You're in the business of data, so that's, you're just self uh, that's just self-service there. Of course it's going to be data. You know, to, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And normally we would call those people annoying. But in this case, I will say, yes, technically you're correct. And so I would say to them, if not data, what then? Again, I can demonstrate 150 years of failure. Why don't we do a full press on data and see what happens? And again, specifically what we need to do is vertically integrate our providers of education and training into the workforce, and we need to reduce variance. And I know that's a nerdy thing to say, so I want to explain what I'm talking about there. Uh, I do want to make a plug for this report of all the things I've read uh, relevant to this job. This report from Harvard, Pathways to Prosperity, is the most compelling. I, that should be required reading for everyone in education and training. I really believe that. And they may, they're, what they're trying to do with this report is address uh, the Tom Friedman, the Earth is Flat uh, book. And they say the new three R's are rigor, relevance, and relationships. And I honestly believe with Common Core, we have rigor and relevance. I, I feel very confident. What we continue to mess up is the relationships. Now, what they're specifically talking about here in relationships are between providers and employers for it to be job-based. But I think also amongst these stacks, that these, these different layers of it have to be able to start talking to each other so we can better inform our clients on how they can have a better life for them and their families. And the other thing that this uh, Pathways to Prosperity points out is that everyone in the new economy needs some kind of post-secondary credential, whether it be a de degree, a certificate or even an industry certification. And so that goes back to me talking about you know, the classes that I taught. Of those systems, we actually know the least about the industry certifications. And I think they can play a very important role, especially in any of those places that had read, to get folks into what Tony Carnival calls middle jobs, where they don't require a degree but they do require some representation that you have a set of skills that are employable. Everyone needs that in the modern workforce, especially to, for, the, for the, the poor folks to break into these middle jobs. 
Here's some of the ways that I'm thinking that we can help folks. Uh, we joined this effort, the Economic Success Measures from collegemeasures.org. Uh, there are six states that participate in that. There's quite a bit of capacity represented uh, to give these folks data. And some of the things that come out of it, I kind of already spoiled here. Uh, this one represents, you can see, uh, percent of completers at the institutional level. You can combine that with the iPads data to get an idea of how much the degree is going to cost there. But also is this idea, again, let's think about that single mom with a kid. Uh, what am I going to do? What's the best path for forward for our family? If she's considering becoming an RN, she can go through a four-year program and make $44,827 in the state. That's the average salary. Or she can become an AARN and make $43,404. And even a lot of people aren't aware of that. And just just think about the time savings and money savings and, and so on and so forth. We need to make sure that our users are aware that there are alternate pathways. One of the problems in all this is, is effect size. At, at the individual level, I was a non-traditional learner. I came from the military before going to college. It really is N equals 1. And so the question becomes, what level of detail is really needed? And I understand in some in some situations that, that the only way to do it is data at the individual level. But I also think there's a great deal we can do with data that we already have at the aggregate level. And one of the things you have to realize here, when I give data to researchers, they, they're working with what I call thin data. And you can tell because they want as many variables as they have, and they will put together as complicated regression formulas as you can even imagine. And I'm not sure that that's the kind of thing I'm talking about entirely here. That's thin data. And I go back to what George Box always said about this. All models wrong, but some are useful. So if just because you have more variables doesn't make your research more useful. It's the utility that judges the value of your research, not necessarily you know, how many Greek letters you threw in, because the other one comes from Thomas Cook, beware of fancy models wearing Greek clothing. Again, if we can't easily explain this to that single mom, she's not going to understand a regression formula. She wants to know descriptive statistics, what percent of people are completing. What's my chances of completing this program, given as much information as I can? And so I go back to this idea of thick data. The thick data is data with context, and the great providers of thick data are those people in, in your schools and agencies that are collecting and responsible for reporting these data. And my example of this is uh, Google Flu Trends, who tried to uh, uh, predict flu based on searches in Google, and it was unsuccessful. And it turned out that the people that actually know about the flu trends are those that are actually giving out vaccinations or treating folks and so on and so forth. And that's who the thick data folks are. So what I, my goal for this is meaningful measures. Let's give the thick data folks a chance. That if you put them together and say, well, we have these data, this is a meaningful measure of the handoff from one agency to other, and we build those tools for consumers, I think that uh, we'll certainly build a much better informed public, and that's what we should be uh, striving toward. My final point on this is that a lot of people don't know about early learning. And, and so you need to be aware, 85%, according to Del Purvis, a person's intellect, personality, social skills developed by age five, and yet we know very little about it. And so the question is, what do you know, if you're in an elementary school, about those kids that came to you from a pre-K program? And my guess is you know very little. And the question is, what do you need to know? And more importantly, what does that pre-K program um, uh, what would they need to know about kids that have gone through your, your programs also? 95% of public investment in education after age five, yet we know nothing about this, uh, this, 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 this other layer of the stack, and that's, that's really kind of sad. I do want to make you aware of these two things. If, you're, if you have a pen, you might want to jot this down about these two resources that are out there. They're very easy to understand. They're very good. Because you need to understand that new regulations around FERPA do allow data to flow back to a prior institution. So that pre-K program can know about how their kids did in elementary school so they can improve their instruction. 
Uh, these two resources are very valuable. One is from the Privacy Technical Assistance Center, which is part of the U.S. Department of Education. You can see their Happy Tree logo there. It is a, a, a cheat sheet on FERPA exception, exemptions. The second one is from the Data Quality Campaign. How do you recommend that you folks read that and provide that also to parents and those others that might be concerned about privacy and confidentiality around their students' data? And these are both excellent resources. I can't, I can't say enough about those. I keep both a, a copy of both of those on my desk. All right, last chance for interactivity. I'm about to wrap all this stuff up. I uh, got an assessment question because I want to talk just a little bit about assessment. So here's the question. This time I want more participation. I don't know how I can threaten you, but please, maybe if I just start crying or something, you'll feel guilty and start participating. Here's the question. I even made you a visual to help you out with it. Jack is looking at Ann, but Ann is looking at George. Jack is married, but George is not. Is a married person looking at an unmarried person? So let's get some response. measure of a process. And the reason I'm attracted to that is processes are improved by removing variants. And so quickly I want to go through an example. So this is uh, fourth grade Little Rock. This scatter plot is from our, uh, our data visualization for this called Hive. Each one of those dots represents an individual student and an authorized teacher or principal can go in and hold their mouse over the dot and see the student's name and see the results. And if it's dark blue, there's multiple students that represent those those values. And the general idea here is that growth is on the x axis and scores are on the y. So if I'm a teacher looking at these things, I've grouped my kids into four different stories. And they're four very different stories. Uh, upper right hand quadrant, high growth and high scores. Wouldn't it be great if we could have all kids do that? Uh, below them, high growth but low scores. Quite possibly some of these are below basic. They've been told they're a failure their entire life. Now all of a sudden that teacher has a positive story to share with that child and that child's parents and guardians. He had a really high growth last year. What do you think made the difference so we can replicate it? You go to the left, we have low growth and low scores. That's a double whammy that those kids require a different intervention than the kids on the right. And then up at the top, it's low growth and high scores. These same data at the aggregate level are meaningful also. So here's the same uh, fourth grade uh, literacy growth and scale. And uh, you can see there's a general trend. The higher the growth, the higher the scores. But then we have these three schools out at the very bottom. 
And in terms of total quality management, those would be called a special cause. And so what I would suggest to Little Rock School District is that they should really study what went wrong, what caused that low growth in those three schools so that they can make sure it doesn't happen again. And when you, when you work on variants like that, that's your quickest path toward improvement. Here's another example. This is the same data, but now it's at the teacher level. We've been providing this uh, to administrators in state since 2009. Now it's part of ESEA flexibility. We take a little different approach. What we say here is that what we're interested in is in these teachers here. This is a special cause. Uh, instead of giving every teacher a grade or a you know a bonus if you get in the upper quadrant, we're going to focus on these teachers that represent a special cause. Uh, low growth for whatever reason to try to correct that problem, make sure it doesn't happen again. And my final point on this, I see some of my animations didn't come over, but that's fine too. This is a teacher data from another school. And what I use to represent this, you can see the highest dot up there, that the blue dot is G4 lit. That is an outstanding teacher that does a remarkable job. But you can also see another blue dot kind of hidden in the bottom quadrant down there, and it's the same teacher. So the question is, we sometimes get this wrong about teacher growth because I, I know people want a single number so they can make these hiring firing decisions. And the, and the, the unspoken hypothesis here is that if we just get rid of poor teachers, there's all these really great teachers wanting to get in the system, so we just need to get rid of the, the poor teachers to make room for them. And that's absurd. I mean, if you try to hire an elementary math teacher or a high school math teacher, you know that's not the case. But still, it's a, it's a more fundamental thing here. Is this teacher a good teacher? And I say she's a great teacher. She struggles with math. We have to think about this in a different way. I honestly believe that. This, I honestly believe that if you get this person a little bit of PD on math content, that, that, will, that the teacher's going to be an outstanding math teacher, too. She's just never known that she needed to focus on that. I was also asked to address, how do we do all this stuff? And uh, we prize uh, cheapness and agility over all other things. So we use the LAMP stack, which is entirely open source. It's free. And if you're not aware of it, LAMP stands for the combination of Linux, Apache, MySQL, and, and P language, either uh, PHP, Perl, or Python. We primarily use PHP. We do a little bit of Perl. And we use Amazon's EC2. That's Amazon's cloud platform. And Amazon was the first cloud provider to uh, pass FedRAMP uh, guidelines. And so we work with federal data. So that was important to us, too. And we just don't want to have to be burdened with keeping track of a, of a bunch of hardware around. I, you know, I was a technology coordinator, and I, I never was really fond of hardware, so I wanted to get out of the business. But the really great thing about the Amazon Cloud is a lot of our things get hit during the first two weeks of school when they do our prior to school, when they do all of their in-service. Our, our systems are getting hit hard. We can just uh, dial up more capacity for those services, and then once those two weeks off, we, we dial them back down to a much cheaper level. So those combination of the cloud and the LAMP stack, it really provides us a lot of agility that we're really proud of. And then again, this is just to wrap things up, I really think that of us thick data folks, and I saw Kathy Goes' name out there, so I know that, that she's one too. We're kind of in a dilemma, Kathy, in that, you know, we are tasked with the, the contradictory goals of protecting these data and making them useful. And that's very important, you know, that, that we do that. And again, I think what we need to be able to do is identify these pathways for both the single mom trying to make that decision, uh, anyone that might be helping her make that decision, whether it be public, private, religious, they need to be aware of these pathways. And uh, finally, for that uh, policymaker that's tasked with trying to determine where best to allocate limited funds. So that's my presentation. I thank you for uh, bearing with me on all this. Well, thank, thank you so much, Neil, for that engaging, uh, really interesting presentation. And you touched on so many things from privacy and security to so many ways of using data. And just uh, not surprisingly, the comments and the, in the chat, as well as the, the questions we got in the registration, have, uh, have covered a, a, a wide gamut of topics. And we're just going to, um, to uh, uh, ask you some of these. 
Uh, one question that's come in is uh, is really about this this uh, technique that you talked about, homo homomorphic encryption. A uh, person requested a, a few more words on the practical implications of that, and and is this something that's being used in the state longitudinal data system? Okay, so um, so so it's it's twofold, and I I don't think I mentioned it. Uh, so again, the the workforce ID had the word WF on it, right? And so any of our higher ed data ha starts with HE, and the K twelve data starts with uh, K. And the reason I mention that is because you can't link those things together directly. So nobody can come and claim that uh, we've got all this data linked up because it's not linked up. And that if we want to link that data up, what we have to first do is get permission from the explicit permission from the agencies involved that yes, this is allowable. And then once we do that, we make a temporary crosswalk, which will will allow us to join, uh, if it's uh, uh, WF with higher ed, we make a crosswalk between those two. We get the data set for the research, and then we put a new ID on it. So again, you can't ever point back to, oh, this record represents this one person, uh, other than the terms that say, well, they went to this school. Uh, they're African American. Uh, there's only one African American at that school, so we know who it is. But that's okay because this data is never going public. We have, that's a whole different set of issues relative to the cell size and, and so on and so forth. The homomorphic encryption, though, I do want to make sure people do understand. I don't want to be trying to sell oversell something. The reason it's homomorphic is because it can be decrypted. You can go back the other way. It's very difficult, but you can get an actual name if you need one from an encrypted record. And the reason that's important is because many health-related research uh, uh, things require that ability. And the reason being is if you find something that's of, uh, of, of real value, uh, you want to be able to find the individual members of that research that are affected by that so you can get them medical help as needed and so on and so forth. But again, the idea is to do research on de-identified data. Now the other thing you could have done, let's go back to Imbloom. This is all done, it looks all complicated, but it's all done you know, in a computer so it's fast as a whip. Imbloom could have done all their stuff using homomorphic encryption and, and only the real names show up when the actual teacher or whoever's uh, using that service actually goes to see it. Imbloom didn't have to have that name. The vendor doesn't have to have that name. You can do it all with homomorphic encryption and decrypt it on the fly. And I know this is a, it's, it's an extra layer, but if we're already being confronted by these realities, I think we're going to have to look at being, at, at having to do things like this. I hope that answered your question. Uh, thank you, Neil. And I actually had a follow-up question related to um, homomorphic encryption, which has to do, how do you do this affordably with existing technology and staff or lack thereof? Well, that's, a, that's another good point. So first of all, everything that our office does is open source. We, I've been committed to the open source. I uh, built my first program in 04, uh, so I'm really proud of this. Uh, open source means that it's free. Now, everybody gets the idea of free software wrong. So it's, it's, it's not free in the sense of free beer. It's free in the sense of free puppies. So anyone is more than welcome to take anything that we've developed and implement on their own. But having said that, we're pretty, things are pretty tight around here, so we don't have a lot of time uh, to, to possibly support folks. But, you know, that capacity could be built if there, if there were interest in these things. Like I said, we've already built Tim and Kim. We're pretty proud of the functionality. We would actually like the chance uh, to make it where it was uh, all GUI-driven. 
that anybody could do it. Right now, we're not at that level, and we, you know, we have all these other responsibilities. We've got to do accountability again for K-12 this year. But those are the kind of things that we would look forward to. We, we would really love to be in the business of only doing science. But right now, we also got to keep the lights on. Thanks, Neil. And, and moving from technology a little bit to more about the sort of practical implications of these privacy laws and FERPA, et cetera, is the removal and you're, you know, we know you're not a legal person, but is the removal of personally identifiable information before sharing the data sufficient enough to ensure student privacy and, and compliance with FERPA? Well, you know, you get three lawyers in a room, you're going to have three opinions, right? And so I, I can't really address this. I can say, um, uh, in terms of research, so we, let's go step back a little bit about, about FERPA and whatnot. It was not, when I first got this job in 2006, and we were doing research, FERPA compliant research, uh, most of the research was being done by folks outside the department because we didn't have the capacity. It was 2006, they'd just gotten their first SLDS grant. And I was having to facilitate these research activities done by people outside the agency. And it was all being done with SSN. So we know that FERPA compliant research has been done in the past with SSN. So the first question is, is the research allowable under FERPA is you have to go to that document about the FERPA exemptions. And that, that will tell you what's allowable or what's not. And if it's allowable under FERPA, it's also allowable with SSN. Though I think we would all recognize there's no need for that whatsoever. So I'm not trying to change what FERPA says by any stretch of the imagination. To me, FERPA is the ground level. What can we represent to, the, to our clients, to the folks that we're responsible for, that, that, that give us their data and expect us you know, to, to protect it? What can we tell them that we're doing to make sure that, that their privacy and confidentiality is protected? And I think homomorphic encryption for the purpose of research is the base level. I honestly believe that. And I can give you an example. I'm working on a project now. It's a brilliant project. It's called the Promise Grant. Uh, Arkansas was one of six uh, areas in the nation that got one of these grants, and it's about uh, trying to help kids that receive SSI benefits to move them off of SSI into a job. And there's a big research firm that's associated with that, and they're not using homomorphic encryption. It's still relevant research. It's FERPA compliant. I believe there's a better way that that research can be done, but right now that's what we're working in, so we're going to support that data. In the future, if when they're thinking on ways to do this, if they say, well, you know, the, there's this uh, other concepts out there like homomorphic encryption, would make that research stronger because there's less of a chance of a privacy or confidentiality breach. Thanks, Neil. And, and, and now we're back to technology, but one, one question that um, – that actually I had was uh, how did you uh, develop the you, you refer to it as Tim and Kim I believe as the uh, acronyms but was that how was that actually developed by your center? Well, we we got SLDS grant money uh, thankfully from the U.S. Department of Education, and this is what we this is one of the things that we proposed that that we were actually going to build this system, and so those monies allowed us to uh, hire a programmer a very good programmer, especially with the LAMP stack. And then our other person in-house, uh, Greg Holland, Dr. Greg Holland, he is an expert on uh, identity management. And so between the three of us, lots of time on the whiteboard, uh, but that program is written primarily with, um, it's not the LAMP stack entirely because we use a Postgres database on that. That's another open source database. But it took us about, two years to get it uh, to get it all worked out, but we're really proud of that capacity. And like I said, it's open source, so anyone's free to use it as well. Great. That's really helpful, Neil, and, and appreciate all the, the different resources you're providing to folks here. Uh, we actually have a question that's very substantive uh, about sort of the content in terms of Arkansas and the education system, which is asking, 
person was asking, with the United States being below the global achievement level, why are states like Arkansas not realizing the need to improve the education system, and why is there a battle with Common Core if it provides so much rigor and relevance? That that's, was a, very that's, tough. A, yeah, sorry. That's, a, that's a great question. So I will say this. The governor of our state is very committed to, to these topics, education and rigor in education, especially increasing the number of, um, of those in the state with, uh, with a post-secondary degree. Kind of a funny story, when I started teaching in 1990, the motto for education in Arkansas was thank God for Mississippi, because any educational list there was, Mississippi was 50 and Arkansas was 49. And we have come a long ways in K-12, but unfortunately in higher education, we are still 49th, and it's thank God for West Virginia. But that's, that's no consolation at all. I think you can, you can understand that. So there is committed effort at the state level. Why are some people opposing Common Core? I think it's the same people that brought up the problems with InBloom. It's a... I, I don't, it's above my pay grade. I can't speak to that. It's not, it's certainly not the state as a whole. It is a vocal and visible minority of folks, if that makes sense. And there was just a, I, I watched a local news uh, uh, segment about it uh, the other day, and they were trying to be fair and balanced. So they had the, the director of the Arkansas Department of Education, Tom Kimbrell, talking about this woman's complaint about Common Core. And she was complaining about an activity, not a Common Core standard, and it was an activity related to understanding scale of numbers. And she went before the board, and so they had to give her a, a whole uh, three minutes of, as part of the story, when she obviously didn't know what she was really talking about, but that was the story. So it seems narrative-driven and not rationally driven. So I wish I had better answers. If somebody's got a better answer to help us understand what's going on there, I'm all ears. No, uh, thanks, Neil. I, we we can't expect you to solve every problem for us, but you've certainly given us a lot of uh, great great information here. And I guess another question that's come up is, and this is going back to uh, different types of data and information that can be used. What is being done with database design and data analysis at the regional or state level to determine the efficiency of educational service provision? Uh, in other words, identifying successful services that cost less per unit delivered, uh, incorporating fiscal data. Well, uh, not a lot. That's a good point, and I'll be the first to admit that that we know a lot of things about different layers of the stack. I mean, we we here have had to become experts in workforce and K-12 and higher ed and so on and so forth. But that one that you're talking about, tying outcomes specifically to funding, is really, really tricky and, and for a lot of different reasons. But I do think there's a lot that can be done there. I think uh, that um, uh, um, the, the one side we had on economic metrics, you know, that trying to say, well, this institution had these many people completers, that's a different side of the normal national reporting that institution would have to demonstrate in IPEDS, which is primarily financial. So I think who's ever asking that question is right on, right on target there, is that again, you combine those two things and you have something that's much more powerful for folks. And again, powerful for folks at all levels. It's an individual uh, thinking about what degree they should get into, uh, anyone providing services for that people to help them guide them into the colleges themselves uh, is this program effective if not what can we do to do it better and then finally those uh, policymakers that have to split up the pie amongst uh, all these different agencies that's a great question more needs to be done let me say that not enough is being done well we're going to close with our uh, this q a session with one last question for you neil and it's another really tough one but how are you building capacity for educators to use data from the longitudinal system? Okay, that one uh, we're kind of in a flux on. So, so that was uh, early on. We 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 did quite a few things. One of them was the that Hive 
uh, that shows the individual student data I showed you. The other one was the quick looks that had the teacher and the school and district data. And what the state has done since then is that we've uh, moved over. We've joined the EDFI consortium out of the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. They're creating a system uh, primarily for teachers called Student GPS. And we're also doing a lot of work with uh, parent portals also about um, keeping track of students' homework and absences and, and so on and so forth. But I don't think that job ever ends, is that it really is, my mantra on this, you can ask anybody, it's the user, stupid. What can we do? And all I know is we're not doing enough and we need to do more. So I don't have a, a complete answer for that, but we definitely, these are some of the things we're working on and we need to do a lot more. Well, really appreciate your, your generosity, uh, Neil, in, in presentation and also in, in uh, de delivering such great responses to these questions. At this point in time, we want to transition to our discussant, and we're really delighted that we have Paul Schlickman from the Lowell, Massachusetts uh, District, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Paul. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. This has been a fantastic presentation, and I've learned a lot from it, too. Uh, just as way of background, I'm not really a techie guy. Uh, I'm sort of a, uh, a teacher, teaching and learning guy and a public policy guy, in addition to having district responsibility for looking at data and doing data analysis in my day job. I'm also a school board member and have been for now going on 13 years. Um, so when I'm looking at this, I'm looking at this in terms of what is actionable and what can we do to make this all actionable, uh, either to a school committee or school board or to central administration or principals or teachers. Um, and the conversation leads me to a couple of comments, uh, first of all, that relate to my role and my place as somebody trying to make things, make sense of things on a district level, uh, bringing it down to a school-based level, um, and, and trying to uh, make this actionable. So um, I'm really interested in pulling data so that I can manipulate it. Uh, it is not in my interest, at least it hasn't been to this point, to give data to uh, another data warehouse outside my domain. Because once it's there, it's now locked into the way they want to do business. And if I want to do an, a sophisticated analysis, um, you know, I just can't get there. Um, the second thing is that in terms of moving data to the teacher, uh, the most important thing to do with that is to, both in terms of the confidentiality and, and in terms of the access, is to have it tied into the student data management system and not some other separate system, if it all possible. Because as a child moves in or moves into out of a class or a school, uh, the data becomes readily available in real time, and if you're relying upon other systems to sink in and other logins for teachers to go, go to other places for data, it doesn't work. Um, so one, uh, one of the things that I just wanted to stress in terms of using the data is that triangulation, being able to pull data from multiple sources, combine it, and you know, just sort of look at things from different angles is really an important aspect for us. Uh, and the first thing that we do when we get our state uh, test scores, uh, which is called MCAS here in Massachusetts, um, is to not look at the achievement data, but look at the growth data, because that's going to tell us more about what's happening than the achievement data per se. And uh, you can see that when we go and line up the, the various grade levels for growth data um, um, in mathematics for the district, we can see systemically as a district we do really, really well in, in sixth grade, but not so much in fifth grade. Um, and that's sort of important for us, because if we've got a school or a classroom that is struggling in sixth grade, uh, in the context of us as a district that's doing well, it tells us something different than if we've got a school or a classroom that's doing poorly in grade five. Uh, 
so we need to look at this systemically. Uh, our schools are organized K to 4, 5 to 8, so that we, we look upon that grade 5 in part as being a transition issue, but it's really something that we have to look at systemically. And it's important to be able to take that growth data and graph it out. I don't think it's sufficient to just be able to take a look at where that median score is. Um, we band it out into quintiles uh, to look at it, uh, and we'll do this by school. Uh, we'll do this by grade level. We'll do this uh, on, uh, by um, subgroup. Uh, it's sort of an important part of the way we're looking at it. But one of the strengths that we, we, we do is look at uh, either uh, growth data or achievement data and see how that's aligned with something else that's happening. And when we took a look at fourth grade data, uh, we, we were finding something interesting. Our standards-based report card then, it's changed slightly now, uh, is aligned into four categories of areas of concern, areas of progress, areas of competence, and area of excellence, which is really intended to align with the four areas in, in MCAS of warning, needs, improvement, proficient, or advanced. So in theory, a child who is performing in an area of competence on the report card is also proficient. Um, we were finding that the teachers were rating children proficient or advanced at a much higher rate than the state test, recognizing the fact that because of the way the distribution of test scores are, there's a lot of kids uh, on that boundary between high needs improvement and proficient, and that's sort of a tough thing for both a test and a teacher to discern the barrier. But that's okay. What we're looking for is overall trends, and we saw, a, uh, a, 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 particularly in a couple of buildings, a lot of test scores that were not aligned at all with report card scores. And uh, our look at that tended to be in our more suburban schools and the conclusion that we were able to reach after going and looking at practice, looking at student work, and asking further questions was that teacher expectations and teachers' understanding of what what proficient is in grade four uh, was not particularly aligned to uh, the Massachusetts standards. Um, and we did the same thing for mathematics and more or less came up with uh, almost the same result, uh, we were successfully figuring out about how many advanced kids we had, but the, uh, the, the, the difference between a warning and, and a proficient, between the numbers of kids and, the, uh, and, and uh, that we'd expect and what we were getting out of the report cards was, was uh, kind of dramatic. The other thing that we did, and this is we go into middle schools, um, we get into um, uh, a, a more traditional report card. So we're going for the uh, 90, you know, 90, 80, 70 uh, grades. But what we were looking for here uh, was to match up um, growth and achievement and then also pair that with report card grades. And we can see uh, what I call is feeding the fish. And you can see a lot of the little fish is swimming to the right and up uh, on the display so that you're in that uh, sweet spot where you've got a lot of kids who are uh, high achieving and uh, high growth. Um, and, and that's a pretty picture. But if we go to uh, the same uh, uh, a, a seventh grade teachers' scores, we can see that there was a lot of uh, fish going sort of the wrong direction. Not many were coming up to be fed. And in this particular classroom, uh, we were actually two classrooms, we, we had a really, really high uh, group of kids who were above 240, which is the proficient score, so high achieving but low growth. And until we got that growth measure, we were looking at the scores saying, you know, I, you know, I don't know how they're doing it and getting such high scores. Uh, now we're seeing that it, 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 they walked in the door that way and they were, really weren't progressing very well. Uh, and 
aligning it with report card grades was able to go and show us some other facts as well. So again, going back to the fifth grade, uh, where we had the fish swimming up, uh, the report card grades for the most part seem to make a lot of sense uh, combined with the, uh, with, with the growth score. However, in that uh, seventh grade that we were worried about, you can see a lot of very high grades with very low growth. Uh, to that we were seeing uh, after looking in and interpreting what we saw in the classroom is that uh, the expectations for kids were very low, so you could basically cruise along uh, and get a very high report card grade without really being challenged. So the, the, this, this constellation pointed us to questions which read, uh, led to us to look, look at rigor. Um, but that, that's sort of the message that I wanted to, to add on to, uh, to, to what Neil said. It was for us the importance is to be able to take this apart and play, and so um, we're, we're dealing a lot with issues of CIF uh, compliance and, and communicating our data to the state through a CIF system. Um, for us, what's really important uh, and critical is to be able to take things down, pair things up manipulate and play. And the other thing I wanted to mention is because we're talking about flow back of data, that's very important for us in that um, we do want to take a look at what's going on with early childhood. And, and, and Massachusetts is moving a lot of uh, pre-K programs into something called uh, Learning Strategies Gold, so we're able to go and move data up, uh, but we do have a case, uh, there are times when we want to look at how kids have done when they've left us. Um, a, about 300 students out of each grade, and we're probably uh, about 20, 25% of our kids coming through middle school, go off to the vocational technical high school, which is a separate legal entity to us. And we're interested in seeing how they're doing uh, on test scores and, and outcomes uh, relative to the kids who uh, stay in our high school. And those kinds of questions are ones that we really are interested in answering. And having a statewide data system where we're able to pull data when we need it is sort of a critical factor in that. And that's basically what I set up to, uh, to respond to based on looking at, at Neil's presentation. Uh, which I think uh, gave me a lot of things to think about in terms of how we can do business better. Um, it, 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 we're still learning. I mean, the technology that we have available to go and do data and to, uh, to try to paint a picture of what's happening um, is improving every day, and, uh, and I hope that we have more Neils out there uh, helping us um, uh, in, 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 in our work on a local level. And with that, I'll say thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Paul. Uh, this is Dave Phillips. I'm a researcher with the Rail Northeastern Islands and, and help support the Urban School Improvement Alliance. And uh, my job here for the uh, last 15-minute question and answer is, is just to provide a space to have discussion uh, both between uh, Paul and Neil um, our distinguished presenters today, as well as any participants um, that are that are with us, and we still have uh, just just shy of 80 folks on the phone. So I know there's a high level of interest here, um, and I would invite folks to insert any questions that you have into the chat, um, anything that spurred your thinking across both uh, Paul's and uh, Neil's presentations, and we'll uh, we'll pose these those questions to the, these two gentlemen uh, for our remaining time. Um, I, in, I can start, I think, um, Paul, just with a, a follow-up to, to one of the things that you said. Really appreciate the, the, this idea of what is actionable or getting information um, that is actionable, using these data systems to get it into the hands of the, the people that matter. And mm -hmm. I, you, you talked a lot about the, um, so, some nice presentations of, of those data. And uh, just as a follow-up, where does that data go with the individual instructors? 
Uh, we can and have uh, generated the the uh, scatter plots we have generated and given out to principals uh, and and individual teachers uh, as part of what we do is a. Uh, a data day uh, on the school, so that we'll have a data summit and, and invite teachers in to take a look at it. Um, one of the things that we're also lo uh, really looking critically at is longitudinal data, and within our student data management system, uh, we will keep MCAS scores, not just the actual top level scores, but by uh, content area and question type. One of the things that that I focus on a lot is how well are we doing on the open response questions? Um, and in order to do that, you need the benchmark of what the state average is for that cluster of questions comparing to uh, what any particular cohort is or any individual child. So that when you go back and look at how a child did three or four years ago on, an open res on a set of open response questions, you can get a sense of where they were in the distribution by having that benchmarked out. And all our teachers, can uh, left click on, on, on our student data management system and pull up that history for a child. So it depends on what the question is and what the purpose is. We can package things, we can graph things, we can uh, send th you know, attach data within our management system on specific kids. Uh, you know, that's, that's, it really depends on, on why we're uh, playing with the data. Great, thanks, Paul. No, it's a, that's a, a, a very uh, interesting response, and, and a lot of different options there in terms of flexibility. And Neil, if I could, I would I would uh, I would pose I think a similar question. I think Paul's talked to some pretty specific ways to to try to get this information into the hands of of teachers, um, and I, I would just be curious in general on on some of your thoughts thoughts on that as well. <clears throat> well, we uh, in Hive. Uh, we have a process by which you have to register and you have to get approved before you're allowed to see those data. And what we're doing now is we're making, we're linking that up with the, the roster because again, FERPA things, to make it where they could see all the students uh, in a school, but they only get the actual name of those students that are on their roster. And for me, one of the big things is again, is you can see Hive was a scatter plot. One of the things I've always fought uh, about is providing these data in an Excel spreadsheet. And the reason for that is you give somebody an Excel spreadsheet, and the first thing they're going to do is they're going to sort on the growth from highest to lowest or lowest to highest, whatever, whatever they're interested in. And they're immediately going to lose that context because if you look at it in Hive, you can see both their growth uh, and their scores. And I just noticed I misspelled scores, so I feel horrible about that. <laughs> Any, nobody else caught it too, So, but anywho. Uh, and also how each one of those students are in context with the rest of the class. And I think that context is, is pretty critical. So anytime that we provide data, we're always also trying to provide what is the context. And in these cases, when you're doing individual level data, you, I think the context has to be what's your position vis-a-vis your peers. And so we also take the same approach to the teacher data. One thing that's a little different about the teacher data is that they are in context. That is, uh, you can see all the teachers at a district or within a school, so on and so forth. You can also click a button and see a single teacher's uh, scores over five years. So you can, especially like going back to that uh, difference between the math and the literacy, and uh, I've looked at that five-year report for that teacher, and it's very interesting. It's only the most recent years that she struggled with math. And so I'm not sure what's going on there, but again, there's enough, there's enough context to hopefully, and that's, that's what I think all these data should be. The reason we want to use data as an objective starting point for a meaningful discussion, and that's why a, uh, context is so important to me. Great, thanks, thanks, Neil. Uh, very uh, insightful response to that question as well, and, and I know a tricky one. Um, and we have a, a segue to an audience or participant question. Um, 
and I think we could, I'll, I'll start again with, with Neil to follow up, is the question is, how do you see integrating data systems between districts and community partners? An example here is such as a nonprofit who may also work with your student population. Well, that was a little trickier, but again, once you build the capacity, once you have the sausage factory made, other uses of the sausage factory become pretty easy. So then again, especially if we could, if we could get a better GUI for Kim and Tim, uh, where it could be just a, a matter of seconds to upload some data, Tim strips it out and, and uh, uses the homomorphic encryption and gets it back. And again, UAMS is technically a state agency, but they're kind of they're kind of private also. We do a lot of work with, for example, Arkansas's Advocates for Children that sometimes is specialized. But, but right now, we do not have a good path for that, though we should. And that's a very interesting question, so I need to think about that some more. But we are, we are becoming that centered. We're, we're becoming that trusted broker for folks, and I don't see a reason why, as long as all rules and regulations are followed, why private concerns shouldn't also uh, have access to that capacity? That's a really great question. Thanks, thanks, uh, Neil. And, and Paul, I don't know if that's something that you've ever experienced directly with, with your work in, in Lowell, but uh, any, any data sharing uh, or, or talk to um, integration of, of data systems, for example, from early childhood? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the technical barriers are, are, are what hits us right now, and uh, and, and I think as uh, the state becomes a little more SIF compliant, we'll be able to go and do more. One of the things that we've done sort of back channel is that uh, we have shared data with the vocational technical high school, um, so that when, when they're getting students that move in from Lowell, um, we're able to... Uh, ship the relevant data they ha uh, that we have about their students, particularly students who have uh, a track record of uh, taking uh, the second language learner uh, assessments and, and the MCAS. Um, and we, we're also able to give a download of our information uh, regarding their applicant students. Um, in, that's our biggest share. Uh, we don't get a lot of outside agencies looking for direct data from us at a local level. I want to go back before we leave this, because uh, now that I think I want to make sure that understand, we have provided, uh, so example, that, that one program that's got the teachers and the schools in, it's called Quick Looks. Mm -hmm. We made a version of Quick Looks that was specific to pre-K, the state pre-K program, that links it up to elementary data, specifically a kindergarten inventory that they do uh, prior to the start of kindergarten called QUALS. And that's really interesting because it allows them to see the, the differences between the different providers, the providers of the state pre-K program. But I could definitely see a point why wouldn't a Montessori school want to have that same capacity or even a commercial daycare center? Well, what happens after they leave our site? Mm -hmm. So again, I, I, that's a really compelling question that's got me thinking. And the last thing I need is more work, but I love to think. <laughs> well, great. Well, thanks for the, the, the answers, uh, Neil and Paul, and thanks for the question, Jonathan. Um, I would, uh, another segue that's more related directly um, to the technology and specifically the security um, is the, the the idea of the human factor with the technology technology whether it's technology or, or paper um, you know at, at some point in even the examples that you had Neil um, with Edward Snowden or the our, our hapless VA employee bringing their laptop home is that there it, it's, a, it's a human factor so, so whether that's paper pencil or whether that's um, uh, a, a laptop that's that's a challenge, and I would just be curious on on your your thoughts on, on that. Well, again, you know the Edward Snowden affair is an is an extreme outlier, and I still have to go back to the real threat to privacy. The the real way that your children's privacy is being compromised is is through somebody needing to do something real quick. Uh, again, the schools bought this real expensive program. We need student data in it. How are we going to do this? Well, just email it to them or something. That's the primary vector. I mean, 
the human thing, you, you know, if somebody wants to do ill intent on your systems, I, I guess they could. But again, I think the first order of business is trying to figure out how you can share data with teachers, parents, whoever it is, without exposing personally identifiable information. If you, if you begin with that thought in mind at the beginning, uh, you can see all kinds of things that you're, you're probably doing that, that, that circumvent that. And uh, Paul related, I, I don't know if this has been a, a challenge that you've ever encountered, but uh, any sort of stakeholder concerns surrounding um, your student data and, and the, the use of that information? Not really. We, we, you know, the thing is, is that we, uh, when we set up our student data management system, we are able to customize who can see what fields and what screens so that um, uh, as users need to interact either to read or read and write, we give permission to that group of users. Um, that's basically, and, and that's our biggest uh, context of moving data out in, into the world. Um, the stuff that we're giving out in terms of analysis on a school basis, that we're generally stripping out things that would, would be problematic or giving uh, data out to principals specifically with, uh, w w with specific instructions on what to do with it. Great. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, and it looks like we're in the time that we have left, I'll give this one more question. And we just got a question from Laura Hansen, a participant today, that is um, uh, really relevant to this conversation, it seems. Um, and I, I can start with, uh, I'll start this one with Paul, is, uh, is there a focus on increasing data literacy at the local level with your stakeholders? Um, and, and if so, do you talk to some of the strategies for, uh, for doing that? Uh, yes, and we, we, can't, we can't possibly do enough. We just don't have the capacity to do it to the level that we'd like to. Uh, we do have a principal leadership, uh, uh, which is for, actually for principal central office, assistant principals, and other key administrators. So we're able to have some instructional time there um, to talk about what it is, why we're looking at it, how the data behaves, what, what sort of story we can get from the presentation. Uh, that, that's probably the most critical part of it. The other thing is, is that uh, when we put things out that are presentation quality, uh, we, we try to do it in the same way every time so people are used to the format and have played with the same thing before. We're, you know, I, I try for consistency in, in presentation and, and display. Uh, and, and I think that's one of those little facts in terms of getting people to, to understand what's going on is to uh, be in a familiar context. Great. Great. Thanks. Um, thanks, Paul. Uh, and Neil, similarly, sort of at, at a different level with the Arkansas Research Center, so the Longitudinal Multi-Agency Data System, I don't know if that's part of your charge to work on, or if you have worked on uh, data literacy. Oh, oh, we certainly have, especially at the <clears throat> the K twelve. We haven't done much in the other stuff, but you know we have that Hive and we have that Quick Looks. And I, I didn't mention it before, but um, the reason Hive and Quick Looks exist is because well, it's kind of a funny story. Two thousand seven, I was invited to come to speak at AERA as it be a discussion from I think there were six states there. And uh, we had just put in the system that I was uh, employed to, to deploy, and we were pretty proud. We were delivering student-level data at the teacher level in a secured online fashion. None of the other states that were participants were were able to do that, and so I was getting a lot of questions, and everybody was like, oh, this is so wonderful. And then there was one person the, uh, uh, on the panel discussing, Margaret Heritage from UCLA Crest, says, well, wait a minute. Just because you're giving these people data doesn't mean they're going to be able to make good decisions with them. And I thought about that, and it bummed me out completely because I knew she was exactly correct. And then, you know, whatever reason she felt bad for me, she hooked up with me, and we started a research project on, on what could we do. And that's how Hive and Quick Looks came about. But it's two pieces. It's, it's not only the data visualization 
it's a framework, a series of questions and methodologies that, that the users of the system have to go through to answer. And the reason for that is to make sure that they employ fully disjunctive reasoning. And so we have, <clears throat> I can't tell you how many sets of tires I've worn out on my car traveling the state uh, working with people on this. And uh, it, it's another one of those areas that you cannot do enough. I wish we had more resources to do more. Um, so we're still trying to find our way uh, through these uh, choppy waters, uh, but that is definitely something I'd like to go back to for sure, especially with Margaret. Great. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Neil, and thank you, Paul. And I'm taking a last look in the, in the chat for any additional participant questions. And before I close, I'll just ask both uh, Neil and Paul if you have any specific questions for each other at this point. Uh, before I'll turn this over to Andrew to close this out for today. I have no questions. I, I just want to uh, appreciate uh, the Neil's work and just say that I sort of missed having the cows in the slides. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we all make sacrifices. Yeah, I know. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much then, Paul, again, and Neil for the engaging presentation today. Uh, and thank you, everyone, that's, uh, that's joined us. Um, I am going to uh, now turn this over back over to uh, Andrew Seeger. So thanks, Dave. Um, just to remind you, if you would like to learn more about the Urban School Improvement Alliance, uh, do, go, do go to the uh, Regional Educational Lab for the Northeastern Islands web page. And from there, you can, you can access the USAA page. Uh, to remind you that the, today's files can be downloaded, uh, the bridge event slides can be downloaded from download today's files on your computer if you wish. And uh, in a couple of days, you can also from our uh, web page download a, a recording of this presentation. Um, I, you'll note also that Neil in the chat invited you to email him questions or comments if you have them. And so uh, he's very generous with his time, and I uh, appreciate that. Finally, I want to uh, thank both Neil and uh, Paul Sickman for their, for their time uh, on this and their attention to all the rehearsals and everything we've had, and also to our production staff, Jenny Stern Caruso, uh, Shanna <coughs> Rush, and also our greeter and uh, um, manager, Peter Orn. So uh, thanks to all. Please do finally, uh, one final plea, click on that Survey Monkey uh, option because we'd love to hear from you. And uh, all the best for the rest of the day. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. This concludes the Adobe Connect uh, session. So you can just quit out of that. And if you called in, also uh, just hang up your phone. Thanks so much for participating, and have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.